Okay, all right. So welcome back everyone to uh, lecture 18. So uh, we are in the end game now and I definitely did not wait for five weeks to say that line. Um, or did I? <laughs> um, anyway, so well done. Just before we start, I really want to congratulate everyone since this is probably the last um, uh, main major concept uh, lecture to wrap up all the main concepts here. Um, congratulate everyone to just sticking through. It's um, first of all, it's a tough time, and secondly, this is probably one of the most toughest course. Um, sorry, wrong grammar. You know what I mean. Um, most difficult course um, that you will you will do probably in college. I, I don't know. Um, maybe there are even more, but th this is definitely one of the top ones. Um, I truly believe that if you can go, if you can do well in this course, if you can go through this well and get a lot of things out of this, um, especially in five weeks, not not, uh, not to say the least, um, it, you can you can do anything else well. So I hope I also achieve my goals of um, teaching you or at least encouraging you to uh, pursue, to develop your self-learning skills. It sounds like a cop off for, for uh, me not teaching you everything you need to know in the lecture, but hopefully in the long run, you will see the benefit and, uh, or even you might see the benefit now, uh, but probably um, not before the finals. <laughs> uh, but either way, I um, hope you guys get a lot out of it. So um, thank you very much for being, a lot of you being extremely supportive of um, my trying to improve these uh, courses as well. Um, hopefully I have, uh, demonstrated by example as well how to um, being not good at something in the beginning and um, even I'm not perfect at the end so you hopefully there's improvements along the way that inspires you so that's also um, a big part of my goal um, I mean ultimately all the physics equations these are temporary and um, it's not gonna last so um, I don't really mind if you forget every equation you learn in the course but hopefully some of these more valuable things you do take away so um, uh, let me start by addressing some of the uh, questions and also the announcements of the mock exam. Um, uh, two simple announcements. Um, I think so far is on track. Um, I haven't completed writing the whole thing nor setting up the quiz, but I think if think, uh, I, I should be able to uh, get it accomplished before Friday, which brings me to the second point. Um, I think most of uh, the people are okay on Friday, so um, I told people to message me if they can't do Friday 8 a.m. Um, and uh, there is one of you who messaged me and uh, we made a special arrangement to, for you to take a little earlier. So I got a question here saying, um, one of your friends is not available for Friday. Um, I'm not sure if she's the one who contacted me, um, uh, but yeah, just, uh, but for everyone else, we're gonna set it on Friday. So in case you don't know, um, sorry, the homepage is getting messy and messier but <laughs> um, over here, but just to show you some of the um, uh, useful links and places to navigate around here. Um, so if you haven't noticed already, the Piazza link, I've just put it up front over here is, um, if, in case you haven't bookmarked it or whatever. So it's an easy place you can access that. So do take advantage of that. I know a lot. There's a pool of you, a certain portion of you guys are extremely active there. Um, and, and that's great. Hopefully you guys see a lot of value out of that. And if some of you haven't used it as extensively as you have, um, I think it's a great example. So, like over the weekend, I wasn't able to answer a lot of questions in time. Um, hopefully I caught up with some of them, but a lot of you beat me to the answer. So that's a great um, uh, resource. So, um, and uh, yeah, so if you guys are here, you probably understand how, how you got into the link. Um, uh, the, just uh, with, this is basically what the department recommend us to do for the final, to have a registered link. Um, so we'll basically do that. So you'll register, um, I'll put in a new link over here once we're ready. Um, and uh, so you, you register in advance and save that email, save that link yourself and come in on time. So I definitely recommend you log in uh, at least 15 minutes in advance to the Zoom session. And uh, so make the Zoom session open so that it's open at least 30 minutes in advance. So pop in anywhere from 15 to 20 to 30 minutes in advance, make sure everything is working fine. Um, and uh, if, you, if your computer is not responding, you need to restart it, whatever you have the time to do that. Um, once you're logged in, um, get your camera ready as well and everything, um, try to get everything as ready as quickly as possible. So we'll start exactly at 8 a.m., uh, both for the mock and the final. I think I'll make a separate link for Mark. Um, should I? What do you guys think? Um, let me know in the chat. Uh, uh, yeah, I haven't decided yet. Um, either way, the, the final link will definitely, I'll be putting it over here. So if you do come in late, um, there won't be any extra time. Um, so you, you make sure we start, you know, normally, you know, in the discussion session, you, you go there at exactly at 12 and then um, we have five minutes for you to settle down and set up everything and start at 12.05. But for the final, we actually will start right at eight. Okay, so um, there. Separate link will make it similar. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah let, let me know what, what you guys think. I haven't uh, thought about that yet. All right, so as you scroll down, everything is the same and uh, the final exam page is here. Um, 
So I've added a few lines over here about the mock exam. So um, for the full instructions, make sure um, you read it and sign it and uh, upload it over here. Okay, so while well, that is loading. Um, so make sure you do that before Saturday. Um, for the mock, um, I'll, I, you know, that's fine. Um, just make sure you, as early as you can do it, just get that out of the way. That's, that will be as, that will be good, right? So you can, um, then just like submitting a homework, uh, um, yeah, you can submit it there. Okay, so for the mock, we'll confirm on Friday. If anyone have not uh, emailed me yet, um, make sure that you can't make it, let me know. Um, the solution will be, since there's only a couple, very few of you I, I foresee, um, then um, uh, I'll, we'll arrange something on Thursday evening or something like that. Okay, um, I should be able to make that greater in time, as I said. Um, yeah, if there's any separate link, I'll put it here. I won't put it on the front page since this is just a mock. Um, but for the front page, uh, for the real final, I'll put it right in. Um, uh, easy to access on the home page, right? and then I'll make the assessment where you can access the quiz. All right, and uh, so for the cheat sheet, um, submit it uh, before Thursday night, before Thursday's lecture, because we'll still have a review lecture on Thursday um, at 7 p.m., so submit that before the lecture, and so after the lecture time, after the review lecture, um, around 8.30-ish, um, I will go and just scan through everything. I hope it will just take me, you know, no more than two seconds per, uh, just to look through it. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so there should be two sheets um, and I'll just go through those and give you either a one or a zero. So I'll show you here. I think I have that pre-opened just to, or maybe not. Um, oh, you can also, is it? Yeah, uh, you can also access it in the assessments. So you can go to assessment and then sort it by type, which is the easiest to get everything in the right place. Um, either click from here or that link will bring you to this page. And um, so after that, I'll, uh, I'll just give everyone either a one or a zero. Um, hopefully everyone will just get a one there. Um, this is clearly not an assignment um, that is counted to the final grade, but you, you, you'll, get, you'll know that whether it's approved or not. Um, if it's not okay, um, if, you, if I see that you're putting, so no graphs, no, so basically treat it like a formula sheet. Um, uh, yeah, so no, don't copy your note, whole set of notes on, on there or, uh, or, or, um, or what was I saying? Yeah, full solutions. Um, so yeah, that's a good question about definitions. Um, uh, so for definitions, do not put full sentence. So basically, um, you're not allowed to put definitions in word. You can put definition in equation. You can make a several, I'll allow a several annotation. So it's a little bit more relaxed than a, for, a formula sheet. But I don't want to make it too different from a typical formula, a formula sheet. All right. So I want to let you know the note over here is um, what do I mean by non-trivial equations? So uh, tri so trivial. Um, so basically. If there's an equation that is really complicated, I will explain what I mean by complicated in a second, um, we'll give you that e equation. Um, so, uh, the, the philosophy behind this is things that we expect students should sort of have an idea in their head and know, um, those are what we call trivial equations. And what we mean by that is usually things that are within the equations that have only three variables. <laughs> so for example, F equals MA, uh, the density, rho equals, uh, so that's the definition of density, uh, rho equals to um, mass per unit volume, uh, definition of capacitance. So anything that only have three things in a triangle or you know, in a line, uh, Ohm's law, uh, V equals IR or delta V equals IR, uh, definition of uh, power, um, uh, uh, DEDT, rate of change of energy um, or electric power, which is IV, um, like that. Everything with sort of free variables. Um, these are things that almost all physicists expect whoever takes a physics course. Um, who, almost all physics professors expect who, any student who takes a physics course should sort of know this. Now, why do we always still give a formula sheet? And this is one of the, my, my personal advice here, just for exam tip, even if you go into 3C, it might be different from how I operated here. Um, you'll be given a more traditional formula sheet like this. But my personal advice for you, for those going on to do 3C is, don't treat it as if you have the formula sheet. Treat every equation that has only three variables, make sure you know it by heart. And um, treat, the correct way to treat a formula sheet is, um, go into the exam and think, and uh, almost know all the equations, but when you use it, if you're slightly unsure, use the formula sheet to double check yourself. That's the best way to do physics. The reason to do this, it's, it's not to make your life harder than it is. It's actually to make your life easier because if you are in the mentality of, um, of thinking that you have all the formulas and you don't need to know them, then you really don't know them. That means you don't understand them because if you memorize them and you learn, you actually you know, internalize them, you actually know how to use them. It's a psychology trick. It's a semi-psychology trick. So um, if you actually 
put in that little bit of extra work and just know the formulas. You, you know, if, if every time you need to look up F equals MA or every time you need to look up density is mass per unit volume, you can't do the open response questions well. I just think it, it's impossible. So by doing that extra bit of just memorizing these very simple uh, relations, um, you, you're actually going to boost your grade. So this is my personal advice. Take it or leave it. <laughs> um, I think it's, um, it, it definitely has a um, lot of uh, truth to it. Um, that way, all right? So, you, so my personal advice is, even if you're given a full formula sheet, use it as if you didn't and use it to double check, all right? Um, so uh, now, of course, if there's long formulas like um, the ISO, bar um, what was that? The, the work done from ISO thermal process, which has a log and things like that. So if there's like five variables altogether, those even a, re a real working physicist won't commit them to memories. So um, when a professor look at the equation and judge that, oh, even I don't know this from memory, um, those are the ones that they'll definitely provide it for you in the exam. And those are the ones that I will provide you as well. All right. So um, of course, you can put that in the cheat sheet as well, uh, just in case I did not, but I, I will. Um, yeah, so that's my recommendation of it. Um, and in this case, uh, just I'm opting to use the cheat sheet because I think it's also a good way to motivate um, you guys to study. <laughs> I think it's uh, just rewriting things once. So let's be good. So that's sort of the philosophy behind the, uh, this and the cheat sheet. So if you don't, still don't get um, approved the second time round, um, I'll basically just consider you not approved. All right? So hopefully no one will need that. Uh, well, uh, that case will happen right? um, because in principle, if you know your stuff, it should be doable without a formula sheet and we'll give you anything that is non-trivial, that is uh, very complicated, okay? All right, let me catch up with some of the questions. Uh, let's go up a bit, sorry. Um, I think I've, uh, I've made most of my announcements already, so just uh, let me know if I haven't addressed any questions. I hope to have more better answers. Definitions, okay, I've answered that. Um, uh, for both the mock exam and the final exam, do we upload our answers like how we normally do for topic tests? So for the final exam, it's very similar to topic tests at the end. You, um, instead of just instead of five minutes, you get 10 minutes to upload everything. And again, if you're, if you're overrun by another two or three, you know, four minutes, you know, that, that's, that's fine. We won't be too harsh on that cutoff. Um, but if you had that extra 10 minutes, you know, then we start, we'll start to ask questions on, of that, right? Um, for the mock exam though, um, instead of using the last 10 minutes to do the upload, you use the last 10 minutes to, um, just transfer your answer on your line paper. So do everything on a line paper, just as, because that's the goal, right? To, to mimic the real exam. So do everything on line paper, just use the last 10 minutes. Maybe I'll actually make it 15 because it might take 15 or 20. It will take a little bit more time to transfer things on, um, on the quiz. I'll see how complex the, the, the logistics will be, but uh, don't, don't worry about, you know, uh, I'll make sure you get enough time. Um, yeah, so that's the only difference for the mock. You transfer things into the quiz so that um, Canvas can automatically grade it. And as a result, you also don't get partial credits. Um, Upload our answer. I don't know. Uh, um, yes, for the mock exam, you, so do we need to show work uh, for mock exam? In principle, you don't, but I would suggest you just do it exactly as a as a final exam. And if um, if I can do it, I'll also release the grading key. Again, I don't want to commit myself to there, so but I, I'll try to release the grading key as well. So you can actually take the grading key and grade it yourself. Um, so you've seen the grading keys, uh, basically the, the ones I give the, the graders and the TAs to follow that too. Great. So, um, so you, what you can do is um, after Canvas automatically grades it and then it tells you, oh, you, you're, you got 50%. Um, you <laughs> um, so if you look at that and go, okay, I'm very disappointed. And then you can look at your grading key and then look at your own working and then you can grade it yourself uh, because the TAs don't have enough time to, to do it twice, right, do two, two big exams. So you can do it yourself and then see that, oh, okay, so do it, you know, don't cheat it with yourself. You just be honest with yourself. If I'm a grader, how would I uh, grade this? So you'll get a rough idea. Oh, actually, if, if I show all my steps, um, even though I got a lot of my final answers, I didn't got the final step right, um, a lot of things I will at least get partial credits and it's actually 80%, not 50, you know, then you'll know what to expect. Right? So that's the goal. So yes, you don't have to show work for the mock, but just, that's what I'll recommend, right? Um, you, know, you don't need to show your work. Uh, I'm a bit confused how we show work. With the answer. Hopefully I've answered that question, Megan. Um, for the mock exam, do we type an answer? Yeah, uh, I think I've answered that, submit it, yes. Uh, yeah, so you don't need to um, upload the full photo for the mock, uh, but yes, for the final. So the, fin yeah, so the final, think it more like um, topic test, but three times as long. Yep, good, thanks for answering part of it for me. Uh, all the questions. How many questions will there be on the mock and the final? Uh, so roughly speaking, like three t uh, tests. So roughly speaking, six 
short answers and three uh, open response. Okay, there might be plus or minus one uh, depending on the level. Okay, um, so for the monkey sign, what do we need? Cool. All right. Good. Did I did I leave out anything? Okay. I think uh, everyone's happy, right? Cool. All right. I'll switch back over here, and we will go to our final concepts for today. All right, good. So um, I, there, there is actually the uh, more look at this. There's a lot of uh, cool applications and stuff that are very important applications and, and things this topic uh, brings us into because as you know, we're uh, looking at electromagnetism. And it's just whether it's from a fundamental, you know, theoretical point of view, which is what I enjoy, or a practical uh, uh, point of view, this is, such a, a very immense topic, right? So um, I'm aware that you have a test on, uh, on Thursday as well. So, uh, oh, a quick announcement for that as well, just remember, in case anyone did not see the Slack uh, announcement, uh, that will only be short answers because the homework, you know, you haven't have time enough to do that. So you cannot focus today and tomorrow uh, energy in just uh, understanding everything on, on that short answer practice. Uh, quizzes. So yeah, so, there, so, so there'll be four uh, short answer questions. In fact, basically, probably one on magnetic force, one on man magnetic fields, one on transformers, which we'll talk about today. And uh, guys, that's not what you're thinking. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, what's the last one? On, um, on uh, lens law, I'll mention that today as well. So those. All right. Um, yeah, so I probably will not be able to um, give you all the fascinating examples out so that I will give you all the major uh, concepts first. Okay, so um, I really hope um, most of you will show up tomorrow as well because um, the goal is to um, do some of the problems, actual problems. Open. Actually, I'll probably, you know what, um, if you guys vote in some of the practice problems into the, um, into the uh, poll, into the open poll, let me just show you once in case anyone missed it from before. I think someone already submitted one or two problems here, so that's good. Although I don't know why you're voting on the example ones. <laughs> I hope that's not uh, intentional because uh, those are just random numbers I put. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah. If you vote in those, um, I will. I can actually go through that as well. So um, yeah. So for tomorrow, if you're practicing on the practice five, and um, and you are uh, some of them that I did not give you an uh, answer on the document, and you want me to go through it in tomorrow's lecture, that's what I'll do. Right. Um, and if that problem happened to show up on Thursday, you know, good for you. <laughs> um, I I will try to go through it with a poker face and uh, um, and just explain it, you know, explain the full answer. Um, so yeah, so yeah, that's the plan of it, right? So so uh, I would encourage all of you to to come to the lecture and we'll do that. Um, and uh, I'll also give me a chance to sort of fill in the last few bits that if in case I didn't uh, able to go through here, right? But the key concepts I will. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, to, right off the bat, I'll in that spirit, I'll right off the bat, I'll let you know exactly what are the key bits um, from today. For uh, and there's basically three key equations in this new chapter. So it, from chapter 18, okay, uh, of my syllabus, um, which is called uh, electromagnetic induction. All right, so the reference textbook chapter from Gian Coley is uh, chapter 29.124 and 6. You can skip 5. Okay. And there are three key equations. I'll write them down uh, right off the bat. Okay, so the first one, it's a new definition um, called magnetic flux. Okay, so it goes by this. Okay. And the second one is called Faraday Lenz Law. And looks like this. Maybe I should put a subscript B here. And the third one is called the Transformers Equation. So this is the goal of today to understand what are these three equations. This is a second part to the Transformers Equation. Uh, maybe I'll put it at the end as well. Uh, notice the, the P and the S, this one matches, this part flips around. Um, we'll go through what all these means. So these are the three things, three key takeaway. I'll throw them right out um, in the beginning. Um, basically, this is a new definition. We'll learn a new concept. So remember what is a definition. Um, actually, let me write down all first. And this is a, a this equation will represent, it's going to point to something deep, something really deep in physics. And this equation actually points to something very practical. Okay. So 
it's going to be quite an interesting lecture. You're going to learn one new concept. As you see, the, the concept feeds back in over here. You're going to learn something very deep about the universe, how it works, and going to learn something very, very practical that you basically use every day. I bet you, I don't think anyone is not using um, the concept of the physics of this every day um, that you probably don't realize. Um, yes. Uh, all right. So let me um, address the, what's by, by now at the end of the course, hopefully this is one thing you learn about physics as well. Um, in 3A, probably when you first started out with physics, you probably don't know that not all equal signs are created equal. <laughs> I, I like that saying. Um, so not all equal signs are created equal because when, we, when sometimes we say equal, uh, something is, when you say something equals to something, it can either be a definition, it can be a formula, it can be a law. Okay. Um, if you're studying math a lot, it can also be an identity. Okay. Now, a def that's why uh, in as much as I can, I usually try to differentiate them. If it's a definition, I try to uh, use a separate symbol to emphasize it. Obviously, you don't have to, but you can emphasize it that way. Uh, if you do math identity, um, people use this sign, which means it's, uh, what's on the left, something is not just equal to, but to emphasize something is identical to something. Um, this doesn't show up in physics as much, but uh, yeah, it's mainly these three. All right. So the, um, what is a definition? A definition is trying to introduce something new in terms of old things, maybe a lot of old things. So just over here, um, if, uh, all right, even explain what this is. Um, this is what it is, essentially. You know exactly what is a B field already. You know what the magnetic field vector is, right? So the, there's the magnetic field strength, which we talked about in lecture 16. Um, and then there is the magnetic field lines, which will tell you the direction at that point, right? So when you combine them, just like electric field vectors, you can create magnetic field vectors, exactly the same idea. All right, so A actually stands for area in a second. I'll write that more clearly. Now, area doesn't seem like a vector to you, but I'll tell you what does an area vector mean in a second. So once you know what that is, you're using something old to define a new concept. Basically, this is a combination that shows up so much in uh, this topic that basically the, the whole idea of definition is we're lazy and we just want to invent one symbol to represent two or three symbols together. That's what the def definition is, right? Um, as, a, as a result, definitions are always true, right? It, you can make a note, I won't write out everything just to save a little time. You can make a little note to, note to yourself. Definitions are always true. It, uh, whereas formulas and laws are not necessarily always true. So, this means from a studying perspective, when you study something that is a formula or a law, make sure you learn when is the domain of applicability, when is the domain of validity, like when can you use these, or you can remember the other thing, when, when you cannot use it, okay? Know the limitations of these. For example, Newton's second law, F equals MA, you know, that's clearly a law, it has a limitation you have to be in what's called an inertial frame. That means you either have to be the observer, either has to be at rest or on a car that is moving at a constant velocity. If you're on a plane that is accelerating, F does not equal to MA. The net force does not equal to MA. If you're on either uh, accelerating frame of reference, um, so frame of reference is quite uh, self-explanatory. You're, you're looking at something at a, with a certain observer, right? Um, so if you're on a car that's moving at constant velocity, F equals the whole total force it does provide the acceleration, right? But if you're on a plane that is accelerating, um, if I hang an apple in front of myself like this, and then you'll see uh, the apple uh, inexplicably just uh, seems like it experiences a force pushing to, towards my face when the, when the plane accelerates this way, and, and this seems to come out of nowhere, right? There's no contact or non-contact force pushing it this way. So um, that will not work. So, Usually that is, um, that is given, that, so that's why Newton's second law most of the time works because whenever we give you a, a scenario, we sort of assume that you're in the right frame of reference. Right? Um, but they're, they're more, um, for example, hydrostatic equation. Uh, might as well throw in a little bit of review now. Um, the hydrostatic equation, right? So that's an equation or that's actually a formula. Um, a formula is something that relates old concepts to old concepts in special cases. So for example, the hydrostatic equation, if you remember, it's P equals two. P plus rho GH, one of them is top, one of them is bottom. I always don't remember which one, so I just figured it out. Uh, should, I, should the pressure on top be larger or smaller? Well, the bottom should be larger pressure, right? So uh, this should be this way. So the top um, plus something should be equal to the bottom. Now, do you know what's per pressure? Yeah, because pressure is defined as force per unit area. You know what's density. Density is defined in a separate chapter. You know what's G from 3A. You know what's uh, height is basically length. You, so you see that every single concept is an old concept. You're not defining anything new in formulas or you know, equations. Um, uh, so, for, let me also use formulas slash equations, um, whatever is the general term for these things. Um, so, 
this is relating it in a special case, this is true, right? What is the special case for hydrostatic equation? Is if the fluid doesn't move. So if it's at rest, it's a static, then this will be true. If it does move, it's actually Bernoulli's equation. And actually now you real realize, um, after learning those two topics, you realize this is actually just a special case of Bernoulli's equation when you set the velocity equals to zero. Um, so yeah, uh, Bernoulli's equation has its limitation as well. If you dig back to ages and ages ago in week one, <laughs> when we learned about Bernoulli's equation, it has to be applied to steady flow fluids, right? Incompressible, uh, sorry, ideal fluids, right? So incompressible, you know, uh, no viscosity and et cetera. So there's three conditions it has to. When you, your fluid has viscosity, you cannot, right? So uh, this is a hint for you when you're studying um, that you mark down what is a definition, what is the equation because, or a formula, because um, one easy mistake a lot of students make in solving problems is applying a formula when they're not supposed to. Now, definitions is always true because you're literally just giving something a new name. So it's always true, right? So you can use it any time in your life. There's never a case that it's not going to be true. It's just like saying, um, I'm defining this fruit to be an apple. Well, when is this not true? No, well, no, it's, it, it is a, that's just what I'm calling it, right? So there's no argument there. There's no way to argue that. Now, law is very similar to the uh, formula. It's, if you think about F equals MA, each of the concepts is also defined separately. But the difference uh, between these two is this can be derived and this cannot be derived. I'm not going to write a full sentence, but um, this is the whole idea. Just a recap for you guys is, remember in physics, we try to understand where everything comes from. And if there's a relationship, so this is telling you some relationship, some special relationship in some special case, um, so that if you know some, some quantity that you're interested in, you'll know another quantity that you're interested in. So that's what the equations are for. They're, that's how they are going to make our lives better, right? But if you keep asking where, where these relation comes from, there must be a starting point, And that's where the law comes in. Um, that's basically in physics, or at least in theoretical physics, our whole goal is to try to reduce the number of laws as much as possible. Hopefully there's only you know, a handful. And hope the holy grail in physics is the, um, our ultimate goal is to find one single law. It's called the theory of everything. Um, also the title of a movie about Stephen Hawking. Um, it, but it's actually what we call the theory of everything. Um, hopefully there's one simple single law that is a starting point and we can derive everything from it. We're very close. We have something like four or five, a handful. And it, um, it, historically, Ohm's law is not explained. So it, that's why historically it's called a law. Um, now we know where that comes from. And uh, yeah, so we've reduced like thousands of law down to, down, to, um, down to a handful. So that's the achievement of theoretical physics, but that's sort of the difference between them, right? So maybe nowadays there's something called historical law and fundamental law, right? So historical law is just historically, it used to be a law, right? Identity, I won't say too much because I won't, it's also something that's always true, but um, yeah, I won't say too much about that. Oops, what's wrong with my color of my page? Okay. All right, good. So what, what are these three things? Um, so uh, just a quick recap of the whole flow of things of lecture 16, 17, and 18, where we, we're going with this. And in 16, we're introducing a new force, a new type of non-contact force. It's called the magnetic force. So now you have basically three types of force in non-contact force in your head. Um, and here, uh, uh, the, this, the result over here is um, the force on a point charge is given by this. So technically this is always true as well because this is just a rearrangement of the definition of what an electric field is, is the force per unit charge, right? Um, so uh, the force of gravity, although uh, we know force of gravity on earth is mg, in space is g m1 m2 over r square. Um, the better way, now that we introduced the concept of field, it's actually better to think of um, m test. Uh, so this is, you know, a test charge, right? m test times a gravitational field. Let's call it I. So this is the field, gravitational field, not current, okay? Um, so this is a gravitational field like that. So very similar to this. So for magnetic force, it's basically the same idea. Um, the magnetic force on a charge, on an electric charge, which is actually quite interesting, is QVB. Now, these should be vectors, but uh, for simplicity, I'm not going to write them. Maybe I should. Um, here, just to be clear, right? So we made a big deal that you have to put a cross in between. And uh, this guy is um, like this. So I'll use the final version of that. Um, so technically here, there should be a vector as well, but we're not examining that. So don't worry too much about that. So and if your left-hand side is a vector, the right-hand side should be a vector. What's interesting about magnetic field is for electric field and gravity, whichever way your field is, the force is in that direction. So that makes a lot of sense, right? So for gravitational field, it basically points like this towards the earth. So if you have an apple here, so this is your test mass, you'll experience a gravitational force along the direction of your field. For a electric field, right? So if you have a negative charge over here and you have a positive uh, test charge over here, you'll experience a force, electric force that is parallel. So both of these, the keyword is parallel. 
But here, this is in, in, intriguing. Because of the cross product, your result is actually perpendicular towards the field. And it's actually perpendicular to both the velocity and the field. So if your magnetic field, I've been using blue before, so I'll do something similar. Your magnetic field is pointing that way. The force will be going actually um, either out of the screen or uh, somewhere perpendicular to the screen. That's what the force would be. So let's say the particle is actually moving this way. Then uh, you can use your um, either right hand rule. Let me try the right hand rule this time, just so you know both. Um, the, there's a good question on Ken, um, on Piazza asking when do you use left hand or right hand, um, and that was a very good answer as well, which is uh, what how I presented is um, cross the right hand rule where you wrap what you point your hand along the V. In this case, it's somewhere diagonally to the bottom, right? And then uh, wrap your hand, try to wrap your hand 90 degrees towards B uh, and your thumb. So this time the force should be pointing out of the screen. So the force vector is out of the page uh, is a general rule. The right-hand rule is a general rule. Anytime, that's how you would work with cross products. Okay? The, left hand, the Fleming's left-hand rule is a nice mnemonic. Uh, admittedly, I use that more often because it's, it's a quick mnemonic, but it doesn't work all the time. It's only if your, your B and your B, so your inputs over here, are perpendicular. If this is at an angle, so if the B is going like uh, 45 degrees this way, it doesn't work as well. Um, you, if you know what to do, it can, uh, but it's a little bit more confusing. So, uh, whereas if you, you use your right hand rule, um, cross product is a cross product, it works all the time, right? Yeah, so I can double check uh, current field. Yes, so my thumb points uh, right out over here, right? So that's what uh, magnetic force is. So it's a new non contact force, but now this raises a question. What is, how do you know the field, right? So um, part of lecture 17 and, or part of lecture 16 is I told you the sources of sources of B, okay? And I told you there's two types. There's permanent magnets, permanent magnets. This can create an external field from north to south, like this, almost like a capacitor. And um, there is also currents. This is slightly un, uh, less obvious. That currents just will create magnetic fields, right? So we gave a couple of examples. We gave a straight line and the field would go around it like this. And you use your right hand, um, the, uh, you can call it the right hand um, thumb rule or right hand current uh, rule, um, where your thumb points around here and your fingers wrap around. Your, if your thumb points around the current, these will tell you the B field. So don't mix this up. So this one, um, you can call it the, give it a different name for yourself, uh, right hand you know, swiping rule or whatever. And this is a, a right hand wrapping rule or a thumb rule or something like that. They're doing two different things. This one is telling you, given a source, so the current is the source, just like, um, just like these guys are sources. So this is a source mass. This is a source charge that you are very familiar with by now. And now this is a source, this is a source current. So this rule tells you if you're given the, a source current, what is the field that comes from the current? Just like if you're given a source charge. So think back to electricity. If you're given a source, how, what is the field that goes from here? So in electricity, we have all these formulas, right? So we have these magic formulas that uh, I did not explain where they come from, square, sorry. That gives the magnitude of them. If this is a point source or a sphere source, it looks like that. If it is a plane, it looks like this. If it is um, a line, I think these are the three key ones that we give, right? Two pi epsilon not r. You have these magic formulas, and basically it came from a more fundamental law called Gauss's law. So here, I just gave you the uh, formula again, is the B, right, just a mirror on this side. So B from a line is mu naught I over 2 pi R, right? So again, you sort of see some mirror over here. In fact, if you, this is an unofficial comment, is if you take this and flip it with, replace it with 1 over epsilon naught, Right? replace this guy with one over epsilon naught, you exactly, almost exactly get something like this. Um, uh, that is very similar. And there's actually something very deep behind going on here. Um, here's an actually interesting side exercise. If you have uh, extra um, one and a half minute on your hand after the lecture that you have nothing to do, try to Google these two values, multiply together and take the square root um, and take the inverse as well. Anyone make, want to make a venture a random guess on chat what, you, what number you'll get out of this? So if you take these two values, just Google their values or look at one of my topic tests, um, given values, right? these are given. What you actually get is exactly the speed of light, three times 10 to the power of eight. 
And in 3C, you'll, that's what you'll learn. You'll try to learn what's going on over here. So speed, light clearly has something to do with electric fields and magnetic fields. It's like a combination of both. And that is, half, that is almost correct. Um, so uh, just a little teaser for our next quarter, if you guys are doing that. Anyway, back to here. Um, so that's one formula I gave you. Um, what else? Uh, so then I motivated that if you take your straight current and you wrap it around like this, you can draw your magnetic fields. Maybe I should have used blue. Um, you basically they, they will you'll get all these little fields going around here and right, in and out like this and ultimately you'll get something like this okay um, it's not very prominent until you put a lot of loops together so these are called current loops that uh, it looks even more uh, it looks pretty uniform in the middle and then it looks almost like a magnet from a permanent magnet from outside So we call this like an effective North Pole and an effective South Pole uh, one single loop you can too, uh, but it's just not as prominent, right? It doesn't look as uh, uh, Similar to a bar magnet as if you have a lot of loops. Do we have a formula for a single loop? No, do we have a formula for a finite solenoid? No uh, because you see that it's not very, you see this is very symmetric. It's just like a circle. That's why we have simple formula for it. Uh, yes, we do have formulas for these, but it's just more complicated. And lucky for you, you don't need to know. Uh, remember, you're just learning the simplest things in uh, life um, and physics. <laughs> so this is called a solenoid, just to introduce the terminology, right? So you don't have a particular formula for a finite solenoid, but when you have an infinite solenoid, then it's very simple. Um, so if this stretches to infinity, you don't have any more of these edge effects. Um, and you basically, everything is contained inside. Obviously, I can't draw uh, infinite solenoid, but you will have a basically straight line inside. And the formula for that is um, for solenoid, infinite solenoid um, is mu naught n i, right? So again, i is the source current and n is the number per unit length because it's infinity. So um, first of all, the, the length is infinite. infinite uh, um, so technically, you can approximate it like this if you have a very uh, long, you, by now you understand that um, infinite solenoids, although they don't exist, um, you can approximate it if you have a very, very long um, finite solenoid. Right? So in a real life scenario, you don't have this, but if you have something very long, um, you can count how many number of loops you have per what's the real length of it, and then you can approximate basically the field inside. You can, you can see it's pretty uniform already. And finally, actually one thing I did not mention uh, last time that I should fill in today is a toroid. And I, this is basically me taking back what I just said, that infinite solenoids don't exist. Well, yes, they don't exist, but there's a very clever way to actually make this happen, make an infinite solenoid happen. Um, guess what? If you want to, the goal is to eliminate the edge effects, right? All you have to do is wrap this head to the tail, combine it like a donut or a bagel, then um, you will have something like this. And all your magnetic fields is fully contained inside. <laughs> so isn't that smart? Um, and you can basically use the same formula. Uh, you, but um, I'll put it in brackets. Uh, so for a toroid, you, it is the number of turns over uh, the source current. So uh, I'm not gonna write it here just to save a little time. You might want to put a, the subscript source or just put an S next to your I um, like this to remind you that's the, the source current over here. And uh, over the length, but this time the length, because it's basically a solenoid, right? It's a toroid, um, uh, but the length is two pi R. So if you have the radius of this, Right. So if you know the radius, you can find the circumference, which is the, the length of it. So um, you, if you like, you can keep in your cheat sheet, you can drop this down as well. Um, or if you're confident enough, um, technically, that's not a new formula. You, it's basically a re-engineering of, of uh, this, if you understand what's going on over here. Of course, you can definitely put it on just to be safe um, to know that as well. And uh, lecture 18, we basically go through some of the applications, which um, uh, the key ones are DC and AC motor and uh, s uh, something more technical like a velocity selector, which is one of the short answer questions. Um, so make sure you understand uh, that as well, uh, slash mass spectrometer. So th this is a little bit more technical application, but it's very important in physics, right? The discovery of the electron and a lot of modern particle physics are using that. And also something cool like Northern Lights that I showed you at the end. Now you know the physics of what's happening over there. Now the whole idea of this, of motor, I'm gonna focus back on this because that's what's gonna lead into today, is turning electricity into motion. Do you agree? Right, so this is turning electricity, let's say current, into motion, right? Into things, how things move, basically. Now, the goal of today is to flip it back around, this last chapter is to flip it back around. Can I take motion and create electricity out of it? 
if you can, that's the holy grail of it, right? So this is the um, uh, motivating question for uh, this last final chapter. Um, if we can do it, that's great because now if I can somehow create motion um, to just let, let's say take something and spin it around, take something and spin it around, connect this to something. If I can somehow create a flow of current, right? If I can somehow connect this and create some sort of fl current flow just from pure motion, now I hopefully I can connect this to something like a capacitor. Let's put everything we learned together, right? Then all the positive charges will start building up over here and the positive charges are leaving here. So leaving yourself with, or you can think of the negative charges going against the conventional current. So now you build up some sort of capacitance, right? You have all the charges over here, you build up a big capacitance here. Now you disconnect this and then reconnect this to either a light bulb, if you want to light your home, or you connect it to a motor. Um, it must be a circuit symbol for motor, I don't remember. Uh, so if I'm an engineer, I would remember that. So you can connect it to a motor and now basically you have a battery. Now you can discharge it, right? And now you can turn this back into motion. So this is how electric car works basically, right? So um, this part is how you can, is all how all of modern electronic uh, devices or electric devices work, um, uh, turning electricity into motion. So. We know how this part works from last yesterday's lecture, and this is what we want to address. How do you create um, current from motion? Because we understand how currents can create motion. Right. So how do we use motion to create current? And because we already know how currents, we can use how to use current to create motion. Right. So the first um, hint that this is even possible, um, this is. Uh, one cool thing about nature, how symmetric it is. If you can do it one way, you can do it the other way. Um, the, the first hint is when uh, some guy called Faraday tried to do something like this. Um, this is an early experiment that um, they did. Let me try to put it over here. So Faraday, what he did was he took a coil and um, Sorry, I, uh, I should say one step over here is um, the, the reason this uh, is possible, there's actually an intermediate step I uh, forgot to mention. You need the current flowing through a magnetic field, right? Remember, that was what's making it possible. You need a current that flows through a magnetic field. And then it will, from what are your left hand rule and right hand rule and stuff like that, um, this arrows might not be in the right way, but whatever, um, it, it'll um, make this spin, All right? So the idea is, okay, so, um, can I, uh, obviously if I just spin, connect two wires to a conductor and spin this around, um, nothing really happens. You're, you're not causing the electrons to go one way or another, but it looks like there's an interaction, right? Between the magnetic field seems to be doing something with the motion. There seems to be a intrinsic link between, um, basically a uh, nice mnemonic is FBI, <laughs> uh, right? Between force, uh, between some motion, right? Force means motion, uh, current and B. So you might need to, the, what your guess is, can I take, um, the magnetic field and create some current, all right? So uh, before I get to the complicated example here, the simpler thing is what um, Faraday realized, uh, tried to f found out is if you put a permanent magnet over here, like a horseshoe magnet or whatever, that there is a magnetic field. Okay. This time you don't connect it to a battery, but you connect it to a, um, a, an ammeter. So you want to measure the current through here. So actually the, uh, we use the word G um, because this is called uh, galvanometer. Uh, no meter. All right, don't trust me on the spelling. Um, basically, what this is, it's just a, a very sensitive ammeter, right? Because uh, you need to, so even if it's a very small current, a traditional ammeter might not pick it up, and this is a very sensitive one. Right? So, what, what happens is um, nothing happens. So, Faraday was disappointed, sort of in the early 19th century, this, right, so 18 something something. Um, he was quite disappointed because he thought that would work. Now, but as soon as he tr was disappointed and he tried to remove the wire from this, he just wanted to dis disassemble this. The moment he take this away, suddenly this moves or this moves and he registers a current. Then that was very weird because now when he put it back in, um, the moment he, when he was putting it back in, it moved again. But as soon as he placed it there, it doesn't move. So now he realized maybe I need to take this in and out. And he was right. What happens is you need to move this up and down. Like you need to uh, cause this to move. Um, so it's actually, you need, um, mo you need to, and this is how you're linking motion, right? Into currents, um, you're combining, without motion, you won't be able to create any current. So you actually, um, 
motion of um, the wire in order to create a current. Right? So that he, in the lab, he observed this. Now to analyze this a little bit better, because uh, it's easy, you, you can think of it in a separate way. Um, you can try to keep the wire constant, keep the wire fixed, and then move your magnet in and out. Um, this one part, so I can just do a, I can hopefully do an animation. Um, so if you take the magnet and move it in and out of the wire, uh, I don't know if there's any lag on Zoom, I'll try to do it slowly. So if you move the magnet in and out of the wire, um, what you're doing is you're moving the magnetic fields that crosses the wire in and out, right? And that motion, the, when, whenever the, there's a change in magnetic field that goes through the wire, so if, if you're completely away from the wire, now the magnetic field that crosses the wire is zero. There's no current. But as you're moving it in, the magnetic field gets stronger and stronger. And that process will register the current. But if you stand still again, if the field is stationary and there's no motion, there's no current, right? So uh, to summarize that, it's the motion of field, or a better word is change in field string. Yeah, so uh, the more technical word is the second line. Change in field strength gives current. And uh, we coined the term, that we introduced the term induced current. Induced uh, just means uh, sort of generated, right? Generated by uh, an external field. So it's not a current that comes from a battery. It's not from any potential difference set up by a battery or a capacitor. It's induced by simply moving the magnet in and out. So you will change the field strength that is cutting the wire. Okay. So more technically, it's a field strength that is, you will hear this word a lot, cutting the wire, or that just means crossing. Okay. So this is the key concept of the day, right? Um, and uh, this is basically um, an example that he tried to perfect this whole scenario uh, by not using a permanent magnet and moving it in and out, but using an electromagnet. Um, that means you take a apparently three piece of battery, <laughs> you, you hit the switch. And then you remember, you, if you hit the switch, just from we showed on the first slide, you can create an effective north and south pole over here. And you'll basically create a magnetic field. Um, and if you uh, have a soft iron like this in the shape of a torus, uh, that's a fancy word for a donut, um, then you'll create a magnetic field. You, you can actually guide the magnetic field along over here like this, instead of having it sort of just leak around over here. Um, uh, we're not gonna go through too deeply why that is, but uh, hopefully that makes some sort of sense um, intuitively. The moment after you switch it on, there's no current measured over here, but the moment you switch it on and off, so when you're turning it on, there's a spark of cur uh, current, induced current. So here, what you measure on this side over here is I induced. So when you turn it on, you have an induced current. After it's on, there's no current when it stays constant. But when you turn it off, the, uh, the induced current comes on. You, you have a small spark of induced current again. So it's whenever the magnetic field crosses the, cuts the wire over here that goes through the wires on this side changes. The keyword over here, I'll emphasize this one last time, is change. Okay. That works. <laughs> uh, you need a change in field strength. If you have a constant field strength, it doesn't work. All right. Um, now there's many examples you can do. I'll just show you pictures to, for efficiency. So um, you can have a loop like this. And if you move the magnet, a permanent magnet in here, now if you move it up, you see the field strength gets stronger and stronger, right? Before, it, if it's very far away, it's very weak. But as you move it close, it gets stronger. So then you will actually measure a small current, okay? Um, same thing if you move it away, that will work as well. Um, the current actually flows the separate, the different direction. I'll tell you how to uh, measure the direction, how to determine which way it goes in a second. And, um, but if you have no movement, that's part C over here, uh, labeled over here, even though if you have a field, you know, you have a field, it's not no field, but it's no movement of the field. If the B in the coil stays constant, then there will be no current. So just to summarize over here, right, you see, if you move it in, good. Move it out, good. Just stand still, even it's not that the field is zero, the field is there, but still there's no motion. Okay. Uh, this is what uh, we uh, talked about, uh, the simple experiment there. And uh, here's another example. If you move the magnet through some wire, um, then uh, it, you will register current. And then if there's no movement, you see the needle is standing still. If you move it away, now there's a change in field strength, right? 
Now, uh, start to get used to thinking um, from, from, from now. Uh, the key part of this lecture is basically to learn how much current you can create and which direction the current will flow. As you can see, when you move it in, the current flows one way. And when you move it out, you see the arrows flip around. So which way, these are the two main lessons from, from today, which we will address. Okay, um, so get used to thinking. The first thing is get used to thinking the direction of the field strength, the change in field strength. In the first one, when you move the magnet towards the wire, do you think the field strength um, that the wire uh, gets experiencing increase or decrease? Try to type it in the chat. When you move the uh, magnet towards it, do you think the field strength that the wire is experiencing increase or decrease? Increase, good. How about this case, when you move it away? Decrease, right? Very simple, all right? So it's not difficult. And also, if you have no movement, it doesn't increase or decrease, right? It stays constant. That's why there's no change, right? All right, so um, uh, uh, you, just to point out the two formulas that we are going to show very shortly. One is this, one is this. Um, if I plug this in here, right, this is just the definition of what this uh, scary looking symbol is. If I plug that in there, you can see it basically it's a rate of change. Remember, right? This is rate of change. So, um, which is similar to this if you, uh, if the rate is constant. So if rate is constant. So if this equals to a constant, then you can use just delta. So you see, if you have a change in the B field, then you will get some sort of uh, induced EMF. Okay, I'll introduce the words as well. Okay, so this is called induced EMF. So in some sense, you can create an EMF, which is a potential difference, which is a fancy word for potential difference, I remember. Um, you can create a, P, uh, a potential difference or an EMF just by changing the field strength. So remember, this is uh, the magnitude of B, right, which we just write B, is called the magnetic field strength. So if there's a change in the field strength, you'll get induced EMF. Um, it depends on the current of the wire. Remember, current is the most dependent thing, right? So, so remember, if it's the most, it depends on what it depends on what the resistance of the wire or or your whole circuit is, right? Actually, I should say the resistance of the circuit. Um, uh, then it, you will get an induced current. So this is basically the logic. Even before I go into the nitty gritty, the big picture is this, right? So you have a change in B field and it will create an induced EMF. Um, so you'll have some potential difference. And if there's potential difference, current will flow. Uh, but how much current flow depends on also the resistance of your circuit, of your wire or your circuit, whatever you put in your wire. Right? So if you like, what you can do, if anyone went to the science museum before, as, uh, as a kid or even as an adult, um, if you, you can put a light bulb over here and move the magnet in and out of these coils, actually you don't need to go to the science museum. You can do that tonight if you have a magnet, a, maybe not a too heavy light bulb, like one that lights up your room, a very simple light bulb. Um, I'm sure everyone has that in their drawers, right? <laughs> so if you can connect that to a wire, um, the more loose, the better, because the more um, the magnetic field will get, will, the more wire gets experiencing the change in magnetic field, right? Take a magnet, move it in and out of the loop, you can actually create um, light over there, right? So if only I can have something that moves this magnet in and out um, of, uh, of the loop, right? Uh, then that would be great. One stupid example I can already make, this is not the most efficient one, is connect this to a windmill. Uh, I can actually put in more magnets like this. Doesn't matter too much direction. And uh, put this on top of the, some, um, on top of a valley in California or some, uh, whatever, somewhere you know, in a vast plain in Nevada, you'll see these windmills and uh, wind blow on it. This will start uh, turning around. And obviously they don't put a magnet on the wings, they put it somewhere else. But the principle is this, you move the magnet in uh, close and away from the coil and now you can generate electricity. And if you're wise enough not to plug this to a white bulb but to a capacitor, you can store the amount of charge and power your house later on, right? So this is the whole big picture thing, right? And now all I have to do is just to explain all the technical little bits, all right? So um, first of all, let's define this new scary quantity. What is this? Well, first of all, this guy is called, uh, just, this is a Greek symbol called phi, uh, capital phi. The, the, the lower case is this, the capital case is this. Usually we use capital case. What is this called? This thing is called magnetic flux. Right, I'll, this is important definition. And if you look at the, my practice short answer questions for test five, you see that this is really the only new definition in, the, in this whole uh, part five. Everything else, uh, we don't really have a formal definition. So I know what you're thinking. Um, what the flux is this? <laughs> uh, so uh, this is the um, basically the dot product between the magnetic field and the area it crosses. 
Okay. All right. So let's do that in equation form. I'll write this out properly. Right, so it's B dot A. So first of all, there's a dot product, which might scare some of you. So let's disentangle that first. Now, uh, there's two ways to do dot product, geometrically or algebraically with components. So if you have two vectors of A dot B, some of you put a good video on Piazza. You can just do some quick YouTubing and you'll find very good um, uh, videos explaining this. I'll just do a quick one minute explanation. Um, first, if you have two vectors A and B, um, doesn't matter which way they're pointing, they're pointing in two directions, you always have an included angle, right? So this is called included, right? I'll just put a lot of times, I'll just write include like this, right? So um, that's the angle that the two vector sandwiches. Um, so the A dot B, the geometric way is you take the magnitude of A times the uh, magnitude of B and then times cosine the included angle. Okay. Now the dot product is also called scalar product. Actually the full name is called scalar dot product. So sometimes you will call it scalar product for short, sometimes you call it dot product for short. Um, there's also of course the vector cross product which gives you a vector. But the scalar dot product results in a scalar. Okay. So there's no direction that comes out of it unlike the cross product. Right? So you take two vectors and you input two vectors and out comes a scalar. So that's why it's called the scalar product or scalar dot product. So that's one way to do it. Another way is if you look at the components, um, let's say AX, AY, AZ, BX, BY, BZ, you can actually do it without finding, let's say if you're given the components this way, um, you don't need to find somehow, you know, find the included angle and find the A and B. Um, and you can just directly do it, which is A times AX times BX plus AY times BY plus AZ times BZ. Right? Just multiply the product of each of the pairs of components and add them together. So it's very easy to do. I'll save some time by not doing an explicit example, just plugging in numbers. It's just, you know, this times this plus this times this. Now, I'm not going to, obviously, I'm not going to prove you can take a look at some videos that uh, this side is exactly the same as this side. If you take the product, if you take the normal multiplication of these, add them together, it's actually the magnitude of this times the magnitude of this times uh, cosine of the angle. Both of them is very useful, depends on what you're given. Really, this is, if you're given the magnitudes of both and the angle between them, um, th then use this one. If you're given the actual components of the two vectors A and B, use this one. If it's two dimension, forget about the last term, right? All right, so this is my quick uh, two minute review of what dot products are. Now, for today, we'll focus on this one. Although it looks a little bit scary with an angle, we will look at some special cases. It will make it very easy, right? Because if the angle is zero, what is cosine zero? Can someone tell me in the chat? Because if the included angle is zero, a dot b simplifies drastically. Very good, well done. So it just becomes a times b. What about 90 degrees? Tell me if it's 90 degrees, what is a dot b? Very good, it will just be zero. And if it's 180 degrees, that's all you need to know, these three special cases. Very good, so you get minus a b, right? So you, this is probably the key thing. I'll allow you to put this in the cheat sheet if you want. Right? This definitely, if you have a normal um, formula sheet, some professor provide you, they'll definitely not put this in, <laughs> in a formula sheet, but I'll allow you to put it in a cheat sheet. Um, since it's a physics course, it's not a math course. Um, Right. So, but these are the key facts you want to know, right? Um, now, uh, it's a shame I don't have uh, infinite time. I'd love to tell you why, where this comes from. It's very easy to, it sound, it looks so mysterious to you guys right now. Like what, what, who, who made up this madness of uh, things to torture uh, us? But there's a very good reason and very uh, good story to, to tell behind why this is a good, uh, good way to define something like this. But for now, um, I'll keep it short and just say that basically if the, they are parallel, Right, so this is the case where if it's parallel, you just multiply the two magnitudes together. If they are perpendicular to each other, then the dot product will be zero. Um, this will just be a times b. If they are anti-parallel together, because their included angle is 180 degrees, right, then the dot product is negative of that. All right, so this tells us something very useful. So let's only focus on, uh, let's not only, let's first focus on uh, b, perpendicular, sorry, be uh, parallel to A. Okay, so this is a simpler version. It reduces to just B times A. If B parallel to A, I should clarify this. So many people just directly use this formula um, in the wrong scenario, right? So that's the definition. This is just a special case. Make sure you, you know, I'll put extra stars to remind yourself that because it could be zero if they're perpendicular. All right, good. So now you know what a B vector is. I just need to tell you what the area vector is. So remember, vectors have magnitude and direction. So 
if I want to define something new called the area vector, I better tell you what A is and what the direction of A is, right? And clearly, the magnitude, it only makes sense if I call it uh, the magnitude of the area vector, the actual area, right? So if I have any piece of area like this that you can calculate A, the magnitude of that is the, is the, uh, is the, mag is the magnitude of, sorry, the area of this is the magnitude of the area vector, right? So where does the direction go? The direction is something that points perpendicular to it, right? So um, technically, you have two answers, by the way, because uh, you can define this, it's not unique. Uh, you, you can define either going up or down like this. Now, if it's an open surface, then you have actually have two answers and there's no unique answer. Uh, but if you have a closed surface like this, if you have a sphere, right, closed surface, uh, and you, I'm looking at, oh, this particular piece of area like this, right? I just want to look at this particular area. Can I define an area vector for just this shaded area? Yes, you can. And the convention is to define it pointing out like out away from the interior, okay? So that's just a convention. It's just, we, we, we decide which way is called positive and which way is negative. Of course, if you have an open piece of area floating in space, you know, there's no way to tell uh, what's positive and what's negative, right? Um, sure, if this lines up upwards, you can call this positive, uh, but um, if you tilt it, then at an angle, you know, there's no sense of positive or negative anymore, right? Okay, so now you know what an area vector is. So um, the direction is defined as perpendicular to whatever surface you look at. And the uh, magnitude, like how long this area you should draw, uh, this vector you should draw, it just depends on uh, area. So if I have a small piece of area, the area vector associated to it would be in the same direction, but smaller. Yeah. If I have a large piece of area in the same sort of plane, right, then I can, I have the uh, area vector that is in pointing in the exact same direction as the small one, but just longer, right? If I have the big plane, but point A, but tilted this way, now you have the exact same length as A2, but pointing at a different way. So this is what the area vector is, that's it, right? It's not too difficult. All right, so the magnetic flux is basically a way to uh, uh, um, answer how much magnetic field is going through a given area, all right? So I write down the layman definition of it, just because of time, I will not write everything so neatly, so you can reorganize your notes later. Um, so Magnetic flux is a roughly speaking, right, roughly <laughs> defined as uh, how much B field is going through an area, right? So let's keep it simple. Let's have uh, let's have one single current, let's have one single wire, a loop, a wire loop like this, right? So this is the area right, that it, it traverses. So it has some area area of the loop of, of the wire loop, right? Now, uh, instead of making, you know, a permanent magnet that is uh, very difficult to analyze, let me assume the B field is very constant like this first, right? So what is the area vector? Well, if I have, you know, this area, right? Maybe I should use, so imagine you're filling it in, um, the, the orange part is just imaginary. You can imagine yourself defining a area vector. Can you see the B field and the area, the, the B vector and the A vector are parallel? So this, the magnetic flux is just BA in this case. All right, so what does that mean? It means if the field increase, you have a bigger flux. If the area increase, you have a bigger flux. So it's really measuring how much field is going through the area, right? So if you have a larger area, right, so these ones are outside don't count. So if you even have, if you have a big, big magnetic field, external magnetic field and a small loop, only the ones, the area here that counts, right? So remember where this goes in. This tells us the induced EMF. I'll explain the minus sign in a second. So you need to change this, right? So if your magnetic field starts to increase, then good, you will get an EMF. Um, but uh, it has, if your magnetic field outside increases, the EMF will not change. You need the magnetic field that actually goes through the area that, uh, that will, give yourself an induced EMF, all right? So uh, why do we need a dot product? It's to account for this case. If you have a magnetic field going this way and you have a current loop that is, uh, I'll try to, that is, you know, in the plane, I can really draw 3D, but, you know, in the, like parallel <laughs> um, to, to, the, to the field like this, all right? So the loop itself, I hope that makes sense. The loop itself is uh, going in and out of the screen, just like this, right? Um, then how much, just think of the layman definition, the simple definition, how many B field goes through this area? 
Can someone let me know in the chat? Zero, right? There's no field actually going through it. Very good, well done. Um, now let's look at the math. This is the area vector, right? Because this is the plane and you need to define it 90 degrees from it. So the technical definition allows this to work, right? You can see that now B dot A, even though if you, let's say you have, you know, a million Teslas of, uh, and, and a huge area, the magnetic flux, sorry, is still going to be zero in this case. So the dot product is an amazing way to able to take care of both this case and actually does more. Um, if it is at an angle, right, the more complicated case is if it is at an angle and your area is like this, right, so this is your area vector. What does that mean? Well, that means I can resolve the B field into a component. Um, you know, so this is the B field, right? But you can resolve it into a component that is uh, parallel to the area and a component that is, if anything is in an angle, you can always resolve it, right? That is uh, perpendicular to the, to the area. Now, obviously, no matter how long this component is, it's not gonna increase the flux. It's only this one, right? So uh, if I have uh, included angle between B and A, it's only the, B, the magnitude of B cause this that contributes to the flux. As a result, the flux is defined as the magnitude of B times the magnitude of A area included, which neatly combines into this one single formula. Okay. So now you understand, hopefully I've demystified um, this idea of flux. And you can see that um, basically if the flux, if the field is going at an angle, you read the, the one that is parallel to the plane doesn't really contribute any way thing to the flux. It's only the one that's going perpendicular to the plane that contributes to the flux. That's why um, you, th this formula is magically becomes uh, the, the dot product and it's very useful. All right, so you can see that here, for example, um, in this case, the flux is zero. Um, in this case, the flux is uh, B times A, right? If you look at the, this is the included angle of the area vector. They didn't draw the area vector, but you can do it yourself. So if it's at an angle like this, this is the flux. Now um, that we need, just need to complete the story of how, what is the, uh, how much current or how much potential difference or EMF um, this is going to create. And this is Faraday's law. Faraday's law say that the amount of EMF, um, so I'll read this in the textbook, I'm short on time, so I won't write out the word definition, I'll just write out the um, symbol, is proportional to the rate of change of flux. So you can rewrite this as, this is identical to B dot A, or also identical to B A cosine theta, okay, where theta is the included angle. So all of this is fine, it's called Faraday's law. Okay. So here's one very clever way. Um, you, to create an uh, induced EMF, so the induced EMF is uh, created by rate of change. So this is the full wording, a rate of change of magnetic flux. Um, the reason why we put a B over here is, uh, I won't go too far. <laughs> um, right, so the larger the, the, so if you hold, let's change one thing at a time. So what you can do is you have the same area with the same angle to the B field and just change the rate have the, um, so this is constant, this is constant, right? And just increase your B fields, right? So just make dBdt positive, that means it's increasing in strength, um, or if this is negative, that means the B field decrease in strength. Um, if, as long as this guy is non-zero, right? As long as B is not constant, right? If B is also constant, then dBdt, right? if B is a function of T is constant, if it doesn't change in time, you get zero, right? Then you don't get any um, flux. So, Right, so this will give you the induced EMF, right? So this will give you, and then the, the depends on the resistance in the wire, this will tell you, this will give you a current, induced current, like this, okay? And um, this, so this is method number one, you can create currents out of in changing B field, right? How do you change the B field? Move a magnet closer, it will, it will increase. Uh, move a magnet away, it will decrease. Uh, so this calculates the magnitude of the current, induced current or the magnitude of the magnitude of the induced EMF or current. Okay. Method number two is actually you change the area. Okay. So just to save time, I'll show you over here. This is actually another way you can actually induce a current or a potential difference in your loop. You take a piece of wire and you just stretch it, right? Now, can you tell me, does the flux increase or decrease in this process when you go from here to here? It should decrease. 
right? The area that goes through it is smaller. So um, as you can see, uh, there's a current over here, right? I haven't told you how do you determine is it going clockwise or counterclockwise yet, but that's another way. The second way is to change the area and keep everything else constant. Of course, you can change all three things at the same time, but that's very complicated. <laughs> you only deal with changing one thing at a time. All right. Now you see this guy actually put a lot of wire over here because if you just tile it up, um, then you will get a much bigger EMF um, because each loop will get a induced EMF. So if you have, if you just uh, double up your loops, um, so if you have lots of loops and do it at the same time, the total induced EMF is however many loop times uh, a single induced EMF, right? A single loops uh, induced EMF, right? So it's, you'll get this. Right? A single loop will contribute to, to this much. And if you have n loops, you can immediately make the current way bigger. Like if you have a thousand loops and you do that at the same time, and this is what new engineering does. Um, sorry, I might have to overrun a little bit as well. So uh, again, I'll probably end in 15 minutes. Okay, so around 8.40, okay. just to give you guys a rough idea. All right, and the final, the third way is to change the angle, right? So you can um, have uh, B and A constant, right? So this is equals to D flux E T. If you are under Y phi, phi is the Greek letter for F. So F for flux, I guess that's one motivation. D like this. All right, what if the angle is a function of time, right? Um, so uh, you can also do the chain rule if you remember how that works, right? So there's a negative sine minus sine theta, d theta, dt, like this. If you don't remember the chain rule, feel free to just put this in your cheat sheet and you can um, just use this result over here. So this is if uh, a and b is constant, uh, but this guy's change. How does that work? Well, I have another example here. Um, either this or this, right? So now here the flux is huge, right? But if you just spin this around, don't change the B at all. Don't change the, the field strength and don't change the area, right? Don't keep B, the field strength and the area constant. Now just change the angle around it. So just keep spinning this guy around. Suddenly um, you went from a maximum flux, like a lot of flux going through here to zero flux. No field is going through the area if you're parallel to the field, right? If you keep spinning, um, the flux here is decreasing. And if you keep spinning it, now it increases again. Can you see now how I can create electricity by windmills? Um, all I have to do is have a wind turbine and the wind will blow through it. It will spin a coil through a permanent magnet. And now I can create currents go through here. All you have to do is just connect the, the two loose ends onto a capacitor. If you can see the loose ends over here. And now you can store the charges. Right? So now you know how renewable energy works. Of course, it doesn't have to be a windmill. If you live next to a mountain, you can put a water mill um, on a river. Uh, this is how hydroelectricity works. Right? Um, you can Google a lot of pictures about on this. So I'll just save time and not do that here. Um, but base, and then now finally, um, or you can imagine basically a lot of uh, renewable energies is generated this way. So you can create energy um, just like this. Now, how do non-renewable energy work? Like all the power plants that you burn, fossil fuels and coal, how do they work? That's combining the idea with heat engines. Um, now, you, if you um, take a, a piston and you boil it, now you can create either isothermal, whatever process, and have this. Remember, you can connect a thermodynamic cycle to a wheel like this. So if you have a thermodynamic cycle that goes in and out, ide hopefully, ideally, a Carnot type or as close to a Carnot cycle as possible, you can rotate this wheel with just burning fossil fuels or any type of fuels actually, it doesn't matter. As long as you have soft stuff to burn and just move it in and out of the gas, you can rotate this. Now stick a huge um, big um, magnet over here and um, put it, uh, wind up some coils on this side and the other side as much as possible, right? And now you will have uh, this guy spinning in and out of the coils and uh, all you have to do is connect this to a wire and then you will get current going through. So this is how power plants work, all right? Um, and uh, just, just to show you rough, some pictures, this is how you can do it as long as there's something on the other hand, and uh, whether it's renewable or non-renewable, whatever, or just you would just tie it to some cows um, walking in circles <laughs> uh, every day and rotating this. Uh, now you can connect it with uh, the brush. Basically, this is a reverse motor. Remember the AC motor? This is how it connects. Um, now you will be able to uh, uh, power light bulbs and stuff like this. All right.
So then the last uh, 10 minutes, all I need to do is tell you the direction. So now you know how the magnitude works, right? As long as you have a change in flux, there's three factors that affect the flux. You will be able to create a, the induced EMF and you'll be able to find the induced um, current if you know the wire. In. So if you know the, for example, in this case, you need to know the resistance of the light bulb and you can find the current. The current is most dependent thing out of everything. So we, you see why we use EMF is because now this guy looks like a battery. It's the guy providing the produ uh, potential difference for the wire, right? It's producing an EMF, but it's, it's not a battery EMF. It's something induced by moving coils around circuits like this, okay? Um, all right, the way to determine the direction is through Lenz law. And you can read the full sentence of what Lenz law says in the book. Uh, I'll give out the keywords. It's basically saying um, the direction of the induced current will go in a way, will, will be in a way, because um, the, in, the grammar is not going to be pretty, but I'll just convey the key idea, read the um, textbook for the full sentence, will be in a way that the induced B field opposes, opposes the external B field. All right, what does that mean? So, Let's clarify what is induced B field and external B field. Let's do one single loop for simplicity. If there's more loops, it's the same idea, but uh, so you have a lot of currents if you have many loops. All right, so let's start with um, having a very weak field and moving it closer like this, all right? So I will move the field towards here so the flux increases. This is the external B field. And if I move, I can't really draw the animation, but just imagine I keep moving this closer and closer or closer at a very constant rate like this, right? Then the B flux is increasing, right? Then I will get a current out of here, right? I'll get an induced current. Um, let's me just make this a little bit clear. The current is going into the page here and the loop is going into the page and out of the page. So the, this is the way the current is flowing. Let's, sorry. I, I don't know which way the current is flowing and I need to determine which way it is flowing, right? So, so I know the magnitude already. Right? I, I can just briefly write out, right? The magnitude is the EMF divided by R, which is whatever the rate of change of this is divided by whatever. So hopefully this is connected to some resistor um, or some intrinsic resistance of the wire. Uh, that's fine. Um, but so I know the magnitude of this guy. I just need to know the direction of this guy. So, Let's imagine this guy actually flows this way, okay? So it goes in and out like this. So wrap your hand around this current loop. What does that mean? So it's actually producing an extra field in, uh, yeah, so, so it's producing an effective North Pole and an effective South Pole here, right? That's why we didn't review. We need to know which way it does. Um, that's not really opposing this. So that's not what happens. Um, it's really a try and error. It's either this way or that way, right? So um, what it will do, Lenz law tells us, Lenz law is a law, that means there's no way to explain it, it's just the way it is, <laughs> um, at least historically, that's, that's what it's found to be, is that it will create an induced B field. So this is a B field that is created by the wire opposing the external one, like this. All right, so this is the correct answer. I, I always need to do it one way or the other. Right? Actually, there's a quicker way. So the, the, the quicker way is, um, uh, you know the B field is pointing this way, right? So just assume that your thumb is always north. Um, so assume that's the B field pointing this way. And now um, you want something to oppose it, right? So I think zoom is flipped around, but so now point your thumb to the right and then your fingers will tell you uh, which way the current should be going. Okay. So using your right hand, wrap your fingers around like this. And that will be up, okay, if you have a loop. Uh, review lecture 16 if, uh, if you forgot how, what, where this rule comes from. Okay. Right. So that's the direction and the magnitude. So that wraps up this, the, the story. All right. So um, the last couple minutes, uh, last five minutes, I'll give you a few examples. But uh, basically, this is the main bit of it. Let's see. Um, I might not be able to get to transformers, which is a shame. It's, it's a very simple concept. It's that. Um, formula of V, V S over V and S, and S over N P. So um, do you guys want me to have this recorded or should I leave it at tomorrow? Let me know what do you prefer. There's pros and cons. If I get it recorded, um, then you sort of have the material earlier to study, uh, but it's getting late as well. Let me know what you guys prefer. Yes. 
fantastic sample. Okay, all right. Okay, good. Uh, all right, I'll do it tomorrow then. So yeah, let me wrap up in the next five minutes or four minutes to show you the example, right? So see, this time you are in, uh, is the flux increasing or decreasing? The flux is increasing, right? You're making the field stronger and stronger. All right, so now you want to use your right hand, right? Use this rule, use your right hand to point your thumb to oppose the external B field. So it's clear which one's the external, right? Now you want the induced one to oppose it, okay? The induced one is the B field that is created by the induced current. Right? So uh, that's why you want to point your thumb downwards. Uh, look which way your fingers are wrapping if you're watching this. So your fingers are wrapping exactly in the direction that this book um, has labeled. Right? Hopefully you agree with that. Okay. Let's see example two. Now this time you're removing the field. This, uh, when you're removing it, it's usually a little bit more abstract, right? So the field is decreasing, right? So um, there's less and less north poleness. This is how I think about it. There's less and less northness on this side, right? So um, what you, basically it's, it's almost like the wire doesn't want the flux to change. It wants the flux to stay as constant as possible. So if you move this away, the flux is going to decrease because the magnetic field strength is decreasing. It's going to farther, farther, farther away. The wire will create a current, right? Try to wrap your fingers around the current, right? It will create a um, current so that the induced B field will supplement um, the decreasing external B field, okay? So uh, the B field here, the external one's moving away. Um, the current kind of, the wire doesn't want it to leave and it's going to create uh, the current in this way so that so that if there's a current flowing through, right, then there'll be induced B field. So the net B field will stay somewhat constant in here. So this whole idea of Lenz's law is basically saying that it's trying to maintain the status quo, right? So if you think about here is, there is, originally, there's no B field. As, as you move the magnet closer and closer, there's more and more B field, and the wire is not happy about, it doesn't like change. So it's trying to create a induced current um, that if the, the external one goes this way, it's trying to induce something this way so that the nets goes to as zero as possible. Of course, if you are shoving it in, the net will win, but um, will ultimately <laughs> when they don't cancel exactly, but um, the, the induced current is basically trying to um, oppose any change in the external B field. So this case, one more time, is you're making it weaker and weaker, right? So or the external B field was pointing up, but it's just getting weaker. So the current doesn't like change. So the wire doesn't like change. So it's gonna induce a current so that um, it, it uh, helps sup supplements the weakening external B field. Okay. So actually the right wording should be not opposes the external B field, but opposes the change in external B field. Okay. Here's another example to focus on the top. I can have a wire like this in a U shape and then put a metal rod over here, right? So you see this forms a loop. This time I'm not changing the B field. I'm not making it stronger or weaker. I'm just making the area larger by moving it from here to here. Okay, so remember, um, it should actually be external magnetic flux more correctly, right? So now is the flux increasing or decreasing if I move the rod to the right? The flux is increasing because there's more and more field cutting through the loop, right? All right, so which way will the current flow if that's the case? So um, first of all, the B is pointing outwards, right? The, the B, so let me use my index finger to assume it is the, this is, this is the external B field. So let me face the camera. So it's pointing out, directly out of the screen like this. So you want, you want to induce a current that, uh, and uh, the flux is getting larger and larger. So you want to induce a current that reduces this, right? It's gonna oppose this change. So how do you, so first of all, uh, yeah, so it is the external one. So B external, um, so the external flux is getting larger. So what you want is to create an induced B field, the induced one, that opposes this. So if this points out, you want this to point in, all right? How do you make this pointing in? Is you make, um, you, you push your thumb in, so that means the current, as you move this away, right, the current should flow this way. That will push, that will create the induced B field. So I'll use blue for induced and the white as the flux, as the external, right? which is external times T. Right? So the external flux is increasing. You're trying to create a blue one that opposes that change. Okay? 
And uh, you see the answers here. Uh, actually, they made it in terms of electrons. The electrons going upwards means the current flowing down. So this is the right answer, as you can see. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's the, all I have here. Um, next time, basically, just a teaser is introduce what's a transformer. I think it'll take me no more than 15 minutes uh, like that. And um, I will conclude with telling you how does wireless charging work. That is the uh, that final application out of all this. Um, and it works based on transformers. All right, thank you very much for staying as usual. Apologies uh, for the uh, overrun and hope you guys have a good night. Um, and uh, yeah, see you guys tomorrow. Yeah. Goodbye, thank you so much. You're welcome.